Good afternoon, everyone. OK, so I have two challenges today. One challenge is that uh, this is the, the one talk before you and happy hour. The second challenge is this conference has been amazing, and every speaker has been raising the bar on uh, the quality of the presentation. So I'm going to try to do my best, but I need your help. So let's try this one more time. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. So today, I would like to talk to you about PyTorch, and uh, specifically PyTorch at Facebook scale. So how many people here have used PyTorch? Quite a few. Very good. So my talk is two parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about PyTorch, new features. Um, and the second part, I'm going to focus a lot on the scale of Facebook. <coughs> PyTorch has been growing. PyTorch has been growing like a lot over the past two and a half years. We're nearing 1,300 uh, contributors across like many companies. Um, it's gaining a lot of popularity in uh, paper archives. Sorry, I'm calibrating here in the open source world, and uh, we've seen this growth like over the past two and a half years, significantly in the number of papers published using PyTorch. Uh, I think the most important thing here is why is this growth? Uh, personally, I think it's attributed to the simplicity of the API and how easy it is for use. So as the PyTorch has been growing in the external community and the open source community, it also has been growing at Facebook. So you might be wondering, like, how, like, what is the growth of machine learning at Facebook over the past couple, uh, past couple of years? We have been using it pretty much in all our products. I'm sorry, I'm calibrating the, the clickers here. OK. I think this is like an outdated version, but I will go with it. Um, so we've been using it in like ranking recommendation models. We've been using it in like content understanding. We've been using it to like detect offensive, uh, uh, like objectionable content in the platform. It has been growing like a lot in adoption at Facebook and like the number of use cases. So um, why is that? Or like, like why is that? Like how is that enabled? Whoa, this is really something wrong with the clicker and. Uh, I'll try to go with uh, whatever I have here on the screen, so I'll probably look at this one. That's <laughs> completely out of sync. So PyTorch provides like few um, key features. Like one key feature is the eager mode of execution, which means that you can actually write programs, like Python programs. You can debug them easily. You can, like, it's an imperative style of programming. Uh, but also, it gives you the capabilities and power of uh, speed. So it can generate graphs like other uh, deep learning uh, frameworks. And these graphs can be optimized for different hardware. Uh, the second thing, because it gives you this imperative capabilities of writing programs, it allows you to write like dynamic neural networks, really complex control flow if condition for loops. You can just write programs like you're writing Python programs. The third thing, it gives you a lot of distributed training uh, building blocks. So this is very important, particularly for, for, PyTor for Facebook scale, as we're going to see later. <coughs> It also supports hardware accelerated inference. So uh, you might know that PyTorch now also works on the TPUs, uh, Google TPUs. So it gives you like the speed, the efficiency, which is really important when you run at uh, data center scale. But the most important thing, as I mentioned, it's the simplicity of use and the clear APIs. With all these features, it allows us to do research prototype to production really easy which is a very important thing to deploy models at Facebook. The core principles, whenever we think about new features at Facebook or at ByTorch, are two things. One is developer efficiency, how we enable developers to be productive. The second thing is how do we build this at scale? So examples of developer efficiency feature that we added recently are like, for example, like clean APIs, like, uh, like new, um, uh, when we design new features and capabilities. Um, so for example, like in this, wow, so sorry. 
So Clean API's example here is like the, how do we expose transformer networks, for example, uh, in PyTorch. So as uh, RNNs and transformer networks became, became more uh, popular, uh, we started to add this API in PyTorch so they can use that out of the box in a really simple way. The second thing that we provided is Torch Script. So this is about efficiency and performance. So think about Torch Script as a subset of Python programs. This subset is functional subset that enables you to write a PyTorch model just like you're writing Python. It gives you like building blocks, basic building blocks like tensor, like loops, uh, like conditions. Um, and you can, uh, with one annotation, you can transform all this program to a graph. And then you can take this graph, you can optimize it to a different backend uh, and get the speed that you need for inference. You can see the API is really simple. You write just regular Python or the subset of Python that Torch script supports. And then with one annotation, you can convert this to a graph. It has like really good documentation as well that gives you like what are supported, what's not, how to do this. Um, TensorBoard, very popular tool that enables you to visualize models, has native PyTorch support and integration. Building, it, building for scale. So, as I mentioned, because PyTorch gives you the flexibility of writing imperative programs and translate this to a graph, you can take this graph and you can optimize it against different backends. And the, the technology that enables uh, this is called PyTorch JIT. So PyTorch just-in-time compiler enables you to like target XLA, Glow, or TVM. Different backends, PyTorch also integrate like the state-of-the-art libraries like MK, uh, MKLDNN and Cuba QDNN. <coughs> there are a few features that we added recently in open source that makes it even more easier, like name tensors. So you're not confused anymore about what is like N versus C versus W when you're writing convolution networks. Uh, we added Java bindings and uh, we open source Captem, which is uh, model debuggability tools that enables you to visualize uh, how your neural networks are uh, is, is operating. Um, with PyTorch, uh, Torch Script and PyTorch JIT, it also enables us to target the mobile devices. So it's really easy to write the same program and now use Torch Script to optimize for different backends like uh, mobile devices. We provide an array of quantization techniques all the way from dynamic quantization that you can use for something like RNN to quantization-aware training that you can use during your training. Now let's talk about Facebook scale. Over the past 18 months, the growth of data and machine learning pipelines at Facebook has grown significantly. So in 2018, we used to use 30% of our data warehouse footprint. Uh, that's like an order of 800 bitabyte back then. Since then, the data warehouse footprint doubled in size, and the, number, the, the amount of data that we use for machine learning is now grown from 30% to 50%. So if you're doing the math, there is actually a 3x growth over the past 18 months. With this growth, we also saw a growth of the number of users using our systems internally, increased by 2x. And with these users, we saw increase in the number of workflows or experiments. They're training uh, their workload on the platform. Uh, and the complexity of the models themselves also increased. So we know that you know, uh, machine learning is all about experimentation. And the path for experimentation is like getting data, better data, improving the models, and able to deploy this at scale. So um, as an example of our uh, model ev evolution, this is an example of our ranking and recommendation models over four generations. So we first started with very simple like uh, uh, decision trees. We went to like sparse linear regressions to started to use neural networks, and uh, what we call right now sparse and NAN which is like our, uh, like our latest, and we're working on Gen 5 of that. With each one of these generations, 
It came with a lot of compute demand and a lot of data demand that impacted essentially the training time. <laughs> so you can see here like, you know, a trend graph of how our model complexity increased over the past, I think this is even less than uh, nine months here, um, where it went from 20,000 examples per second to an order of like almost 5,000, 6,000. So 4x increase in the compute complexity of these models over a very short period of time. Uh, this is to illustrate the growth of data over also like a small period of time and the increase of number of users. So we're talking about the really large scale here. We're talking about like tens of billions of training examples for a single training run. We're talking uh, about models that doesn't fit in a single machine anymore, that went from gigabytes to hundreds of gigabytes to almost a terabyte in size. We're talking about like hundreds or thousands of experiments run per day. And uh, we're talking about like a lot of different models in production powering all the technologies in Facebook. So this means we need to scale across multiple layers. We need to scale in the infrastructure, all the way from networking, compute, and storage. We need to scale on the platform side so that we allow this fast growth and experimentation. We need to scale on the model size, so we went from megabytes to gigabytes to terabytes. And the algorithms themselves are getting complicated and more sophisticated. So we went from linear regression to deep linear network for something like ranking and recommendation. Now, what makes this hard? Why is this hard? When you look closely on how do we schedule these jobs and how do we run large-scale distributed training, you will find that gang scheduling, which is the ability to schedule things together and run them together so that your model can converge, um, is essential. So it's all or nothing. And then one failed node in your training job will render the whole job as failure. So this graph shows you uh, the relationship between probability of failure giving different, different gang sizes, number of nodes, as time progress. So you can think about the x-axis as like time units. And then you can say the y-axis is probability of failures. So you can see that the probability of failures increase significantly as the gang size increase. So typical training job at Facebook, an order of like 100 node. So this means like probability of failures really becomes low with a single, or a single node failure or probably two failures became high. Other challenges include the, the hardware. We run on heterogeneous hardware in our data centers. Like we can't get all the hardware to be the same generation. Hardware evolve uh, independently. So you get like different CPU architectures, diff the different CPU generations, different uh, GPUs, even different ASICs for training. So scheduling doesn't become just as simple as allocate X resources of compute and X resources of memory, you need to take all these other factors into account so that your training job becomes homogeneous in terms of performance. Uh, the last thing is that, like unlike data pipelines, machine learning is experimental. So it's long running jobs. You don't actually, um, like you don't have a clear idea of the ROI of each job. And then it makes like, things like domain control and a prediction really hard because each job is different. You can't predict. Um, and then because there is sublinear scaling in general uh, in machine learning workload and there is huge scale, this is a recipe for uh, efficiency or inefficiencies in our data centers. So how do we fix that? Wouldn't it be nice if we can write full tolerant and elastic distributed PyTorch jobs. Comes in PyTorch Elastic. So PyTorch Elastic, we open sourced it recently. Uh, we, use it, we use it internally to uh, train large scale computer vision models, like 10 billions of images, 256 GPUs, 1024 GPUs, in an elastic way, so that a single node failure doesn't impact the progress of the job. So we can run this on non-HPC clusters, basically, whereas this is the norm in data centers where failures are norm. And we can run this in mission critical workload. <laughs> but we can also use that to adjust for dynamic capacity. A lot of time you want to train your models, but you don't have the exact capacity that you requested for. So you want to start your training with whatever capacity you have and keep adding machines whenever they become available. 
So it impacts developer productivity as well. This is an example of how it works. You specify the number of like min max nodes that you're targeting and then uh, write your model using PyTorch Elastic APIs. And this allows it for automatic checkpointing, recovery, handling node failures, node disappearing, and node coming back. And it does that transparent to you. Let's take a closer look under, uh, under the hood. So what are the key components of PyTorch Elastic? One key component is the rendezvous mechanism. So this is basically our library uh, or method that, um, that gives you the membership changes, new, new machines coming in your uh, job or disappearing from your job, failing. It also acts as a barrier. So it waits until you requ request the minimum number of machines before it progress. Uh, and basically dynamically assign rank so that you can do like or reduce properly. Uh, the nice thing about the rendezvous is that you can deploy it anywhere. So PyTorch Elastic now is integrated with Kubernetes and AWS without requiring the changes in the underlying infrastructure for the scheduler itself. So this is one nice feature. You can run, look, write your model one, uh, with PyTorch Elastic and essentially run everywhere. <laughs> So PyTorch Elastic addressed the resiliency problem and elasticity problem, but how, how about the big model problem? Models that doesn't fit in a single machine anymore. You want to split your model in like some sort of model parallelism, and you want to support like huge parameters. This is particularly important for something like ranking and recommendation models. PyTorch RPC essentially enables you to write code that runs on remote machines and write this in a way that you're, you're writing it as a single machine. I'm gonna show you an example code uh, shortly. The key components of PyTorch RPC are basically an RPC layer which allows you to run code on remote machine. The second layer is the remote reference which allows you to track or reference a remote tensor that doesn't exist in your machine, it's a remote machine. And we do the garbage collection for dangling references behind the scene. The third and the, the coolest feature, in my opinion, is the distributed autograd. Like one cool feature about PyTorch for people who actually like used it, is that you write the forward path, path, and then PyTorch automatically compute the backward pass for you. Now this works great if you're on a single machine. Distributed autograds enable enable this to happen when you're writing remote tensors and RPC calls. We're going to take a look as well on how this happens. Um, and then distributed optimizers. Uh, the same way because these optimization function need to collect all the weights and compute uh, the loss there. <coughs> so what are the primitives for, our, for PyTorch RPC? So we get like three simple primitives. First primitives is like a, a synchronous RPC call. So you calling, uh, uh, you call a synchronous RPC call to compute something on a remote machine, you wait for the results and then you can use this tensor uh, result. The second one is asynchronous. Uh, call. So you call something asynchronously, gets you a future that is available for you later uh, whenever you need it. And the third one is the remote tensor, the remote reference. Let's look at the example. So you can see here we're defining two nets running on remote workers. And then when we're writing our program, the optimization step, we're, use, we're, we're writing just as if we're writing on a single machine. And all we need to do is this magic step number three with distributed autograd context. And this compute the distributed autograd for you automatically. And you can like, the rest of the steps is no different than writing a PyTorch program on a single machine. So what's happening behind the scene? Let's take an example here. You have two tensors, T1 and T2. Uh, you want to compute, you want to add them together, but you want to add them together on a remote machine. So this happens on worker number one. And then um, you want to, um, two other tensors, T4 and T5, uh, randomize them, then compute the loss. There is um, a mistake in the graph itself. The loss basically is T5 in the graph, uh, and there is a missing sum node. But you, you get the idea. So PyTorch distributed autograd, what it does is inserts this send and receive calls for you automatically and compute 
the gradients, um, knowing that this graph is partitioned across different nodes. So all you need to do, as I said, is this magic word with distributed autograd context, and then everything else works. So um, there is a lot of optimization you can do as well uh, with this thing. What we shipped is the, the fast mode, but this fast uh, requires basically like the send and receive gradients to be computed and all the backward pass, but you can imagine like a lot of optimizations where we don't need to compute a gradients for uh, dangling pointers. Uh, like, um, for example, if you're doing a backward pass on a loss function, you only need to update the relevant parameters that correspond to this loss function computation and nothing else. Uh, this is experimental and work in progress. So, uh, this concludes my talk. Am I good on time? Sweet. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I want to end by a call to action. Uh, PyTorch community is like increasing a lot. We're really uh, excited that there is a lot of contributor across the industry. And um, uh, it's uh, available in like different providers, cloud providers, really easy to use, uh, and has great documentation. So uh, try it out, and thank you so much. Hi there. So a few years ago, the Facebook team published a paper about the, uh, the data center machine learning workloads. And before, it seemed like there was a dichotomy where the researchers were using PyTorch. And then for production use cases, it was mostly CAFE2. Yep. And there was some perhaps work having some intermediate representation to make PyTorch as fast um, as CAFE2. But I wonder if, has there been any changes to this strategy? Yep. And yeah, I, yeah, I think the, the intermediate uh, thing was called Onyx. So um, Cafe2 was deployed in production before PyTorch gained popularity outside. So when PyTorch gained popularity and like researchers within Facebook and outside was re really excited about how to use it, we saw like an uptick of their innovation speed on how to try out ideas. Then we uh, changed our strategy to adopt PyTorch as the platform at Facebook. Now, this requires significant migration. So a lot of our use cases migrated to use uh, PyTorch already particularly around the content understanding use cases. Like you can think computer vision, NLP, speech, uh, machine translation are all using PyTorch at scale in Facebook. Where the complication happens is like the ranking recommendation models. And the complication is not really about the ranking recommendation models themselves, but the infrastructure surrounding them. Data preparation, feature engineering, just deploying at scale, there's a lot of processes that needs to change. So, that one of the key innovations, actually, uh, that pushed us on uh, PyTorch RPC was particularly the ranking and recommendation models. Because we're talking about a significant scale in terms of the model size. We're talking about like a lot of people using it internally, like hundreds of engineers every day. And we're talking about like uh, a lot of data being used for every single model. So you can think about like a single training run is typically hundreds of terabyte of data uh, for a single training runs. And we have like, uh, like thousands of this every day. Uh, so we are in the process right now of migrating our the remaining like uh, ranking and recommendation models to PyTorch, and we are aggressively doing this. So um, PyTorch, because of Torch script as well, the Onyx strategy, um, it's still like other companies or like Microsoft, for example, uh, is adopting Onyx strategy because they have like a C++ runtime. But PyTorch has a very good runtime as well, and the uh, Torch script enabled that, and Digit Compiler enabled that. So. Great. Does this answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, let's say I want to train a, a huge networks over <laughs> four n nodes, a uh, single network. Is there any type of optimization given different hardware, different locations for the nodes to optimize how fast the whole network will run and how much you should allocate of, for each network on each uh, node? Uh, can you repeat the question again? I just want to make sure that I understand it correctly. Uh, I'm wondering whether there is any optimizations for which parts to put on which nodes, and uh, given the size of how performant the nodes are and how far they are from each other. Got it. 
So basically, you know, like optimization on locality, on scheduling, on the hardware characteristics. This goes into two layers. One layer is the HPC scheduler that we're building and using at Facebook that can actually like, try to utilize the best out of the hardware, give you the right hardware for your job. And the second one is the platform side as well. PyTorch itself doesn't try to do anything magic for you. Like, I think this is one of the core principles. It's like simple, whatever you write, you get. So it doesn't try to do magic behind the scene. But we do have uh, libraries on top that we built uh, that has not been open sourced yet. Uh, and it does exactly what you're talking about. It's kind of like auto-tuning. So it tries to like run the models first, gather some performance characteristics of the model, and then decide on partitioning strategy, uh, particularly for like something like embedding tables and how to partition embedding tables across different machines, how to utilize like machines with high memory bandwidth versus high compute, for example. So we do have this internally. Uh, hopefully, we'll open source it as well. Thank you. Let's thank Mohammed one more time. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>